I'll begin by reading at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 and 2 and get into a prolonged introduction, but we will, we will look at chapter 12 today. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the, of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now as we begin, let me give you an introduction here. When you read history, history is filled with stories of those who have thought that they could resist God. The fact is rebellion against God actually began with Satan. Now, the word Satan actually literally is translated adversary. And Satan is an adversary, an opponent of God. And in scripture, when you look at this one who we refer to as Satan, there are actually different names for him that are associated with him throughout the scripture. He's not saying words as, as Satan. He, he is called Abaddon, which literally means uh, destruction or destroyer. He's referred to as Apollyon, which is destroyer. He is called Beelzebub, which is prince of of flies, or Lord of flies. He's called Belial, which means worthless. He's called the devil, which is slanderer. He's referred to as the god of this world. He is a serpent, the wicked one, and he's also referred to as the tempter. Those are just some of the ways that we see him identified in Scripture. But he's also called Lucifer. When you look in uh, Isaiah, in chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, we read, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. The word Lucifer there means morning star. That's what it's translated. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, O Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. This has been referred to in theological studies as the five I wills of Lucifer, this usurpation, this attempt to take from God what belonged to him and to take it for himself. So again, he's referred to as Lucifer or Morning Star. We need to know that Morning Star is actually a, a title of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 22, verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And so Lucifer usurps, attempts to usurp the authority that Jesus himself owns. And the Bible teaches us that he rebelled. He was cast from heaven. And he also incited other angels to rebel. It would appear that he, he took some one-third of the angelic host with him because in Revelation 12, verse 4, it says his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth, which would be a picture of the rebellion. So when he came to earth, he instigated rebellion. He did so in the Garden of Eden. We read our Bibles. We know that he tempted Eve to take of the fruit. We also know that Adam partook of it with her. And Adam fell, and he now has given to us, the hum humankind, his fallen nature. And so fallen man has rebelled against God ever since. Paul, speaking about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, speaking of our fallen nature, said, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So we have a sinful nature. We are sinners by nature. We sin first as because we have a sinful nature. We don't become sinners when we sin. We sin because we are already sinful in our hearts, our nature is already in opposition. Rebellion is something we see from the beginning. You see, often those who fight against God are held up as heroes to be emulated. 
We see that today. We see that in uh, all what would be called the arts. We see that in, in our heroes that are in movies or heroes that are in music, heroes that are writers. That isn't something new. It, it is part of, of humanity. Humanity has always admired the rebels. Uh, some of you have heard the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was um, an ex existentialist and uh, very well known. And Fred, Friedrich Nietzsche died a lunatic. He died infected with syphilis. And yet he's held up by many people, especially progressives, as an, as an emblem to be emulated. Now, there's a, an infidel by the name of Voltaire. And some of you had to read some of his stuff when you took philosophy or whatever in college. Voltaire boasted that with his pen, he would destroy what it took 12 apostles to establish. He died in incredible pain. And the nurse who, who attended his death stated that she would not, for all the money in France, attend the death of another infidel. Uh, years ago, there was a writer by the name of Sinclair Lewis. He, he wrote a, a book called Almer Gantry, which was intended to, to take the church to task and portray the church as being filled with charlatans and thieves. Sinclair Lewis, and he mocked Christianity but died a drunk in a clinic in Rome. It's, uh, it's unwise. It's unwise, and it's always unwise to fight against God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, no, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. In Daniel 4, 35, it reads, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does, he does according to his, his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nobody can question God. Nobody can hold him back, and yet we attempt to do so. So what we have here is we have a man fighting against God, a man who is identified to us in verse 1 of chapter 12 as Herod. Now, let me give you a biographical sketch. It'll take a moment to do that so you get an idea of who this man is. This, is, this man is, is actually Herod Agrippa I. That's who he is. That's his title, and he reigned... Uh, from around 37 to 44 AD. Now, he was the grandson of someone in Scripture referred to as Herod, known as Herod the Great. Um, what happened was his father had um, been murdered, and Herod Agrippa I was sent to Rome to live. While he was in Rome... He grew close to Emperor Tiberius's grand nephew, and he had become, he became emperor in 37. So he gave a grip of rule over northern Israel, Samaria, Judea, as well as Perea, which is modern Jordan. His father was an Edomite, which is an, a Jordanian, but his, his mother was Jewish. She was Maccabean. So that made him popular with Jews because he was partly Jewish. And so this is the man that we're looking at here in chapter chapter 12. So as we look at it, it simply says in verse 1, about that time the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And so this is the man who's, who, who slaughtered, who murdered uh, James. He, he was working hard to maintain good relationships with the Jews, and one of the ways that he felt that he could receive favor from them was to persecute Christians especially the leaders of the Christian church. And so that's what he's doing. He harassed the church and he killed James. Notice with me, James, the brother of John. Now, when it says he killed, verse two, he killed James, the brother of John with the sword, that gives us some insight. Uh, it, it may be something you might not notice, but it says he killed him with the sword. That means that it was under Roman law that he was killed for a civil infraction because if he had been put to death by the Jews for a religious problem, then he would have been stoned to death. Now, I want you to see something here. I'm going to take a moment to point this out, but I find it interesting. James, the brother of John, is one of the 12 apostles. But I want you to notice with me, he, he gets one verse, one verse. 
And it simply says he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. One of the, one of the apostles. When you looked in, in, in the life of Stephen, the first martyr, there was an entire chapter devoted basically to him. But an apostle receives a couple lines in the Bible. It's interesting to me how that took place, but it did. It would seem here that what matters most to the Lord is that uh, he takes notice of it and points it out. But I want to remind you of something. There was a story that we find in Scripture where James and John, the two, two brothers, had approached Jesus with their mom. You remember the story. It's found in Matthew 20. And uh, their mama was Jesus's aunt. And so she approached him, and I'm paraphrasing, but she approached Jesus, and she said, I'd like you to do something for me. Kind of using that aunt relationship. And well, what is it that you want? Well, would you, would you grant that my sons might sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom? And Jesus said, auntie, shut up. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> would you grant this? And, and what she was wanting was for her boys to have prominence in the kingdom of God. And she was using her family ties to try and produce that on behalf of her boys. And so Jesus began to speak. And again, you remember the story, and he began to speak with them. You don't know, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink of the cup that I will be drinking of? Are, are you able, in other words, to suffer in the way that I'm going to suffer? And, and they answered him and said, yeah, we are. And uh, so very often, so very often in the Christian life, we think ourselves stronger than we actually are. And we think our faith to be more developed than it really is. And... We don't understand the depth of cost that may be exacted if we actually receive that which we want to have in terms of prominence in the kingdom of God. Because you can't wear a crown without a cross. It doesn't happen that way. And the one who is used much of the Lord very often suffers much. As a matter of fact, very often when the Lord intends to use somebody in a deep way, it has been said he wounds that person deeply. And faithful are the wounds of the Lord. Because what it does is it removes from you self. It removes from you the temptation to glorify yourself through what you've achieved. It reduces you to dependence on God and ultimately, when whatever it is that is done is finished, God gets all the glory. Paul makes that very clear when he speaks to the, to, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, and he speaks concerning the fact that there aren't many noble and rich, etc. kinds of people that God has called, but they are, he says, they're the offscouring, they're the people who, who are really the least and not the greatest, and these are the ones that the Lord uses. And, and then he says, the reason why is so no flesh will glory in his sight. See, the Lord has a way of removing from us the things we trust most in in order to teach us to trust most in him. Some people never learn that lesson. Some don't because they don't want to go there because they want to buy into this idea that they can have that, that crown without a cross. But you don't find that in Scripture. And so you have James, and you have John, and you have their mama, and they approach Jesus. I want one on the right hand. I want one on the left hand. Would you grant that? For me to grant that isn't in my, in my, my purview. It's something my father does. But you guys are asking for something you don't understand. Are you able to drink? Are you able to suffer in the way that, that it's required? Oh, yes, we are. And then Jesus made it very clear. He said uh, in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 39, he said, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. You will go through a road of suffering. And so what we have here is we have a fulfillment of that promise that God had made, that Jesus had made to James, where it says in verse 2 that Herod killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He was beheaded is how he died. Now, 
Verse 3, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. <laughs> it was during the days of unleavened bread. So it seems to me that at this time, Peter is what we would call a jailbird. I mean, he's, he's been put away more than once. When you look in chapter 4, verse 3, as well as chapter 5, verse 19, He's already been in, in jail two times. So this is his third arrest. What is happening is in order to gain favor, he arrests Peter, and he does it during the days of unleavened, uh, unleavened bread. Uh, the days of unleavened bread uh, represent a week-long uh, festival that's followed by the Passover. And when this is taking place, there are great crowds that are gathered together. And so from the way he's thinking, the the greater the amount of people, the better his image will be to the Jews. So he's doing something in order to get their favor. And so what happens is he, uh, he, he, he seizes Peter. It's during the days of unleavened bread in verse 4. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping or guarding the prison. And so it speaks here about four squads. When you look at these squads, each squad had four soldiers per squad. So it's speaking about 16 soldiers that are guarding him. Notice in verse 6 that he was bound with two chains. So there were chains on his wrist, and he was sleeping between two soldiers. And there are also two guards posted at the door. So that looks like he's pretty secure, isn't, isn't he? So obviously, they're taking no chances that any sympathizers might get to him and set him free. But we have seen already that this, does, this doesn't guarantee anything because, again, Peter had been in jail before, but he got what we would call an early release because in Acts 5.19, it said an angel of the Lord opened the prison door and brought him out. So there was a jailbreak that the Lord had orchestrated before. You see, God has other plans. Notice again in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So the church knew only God had the power to release this man. And with great agony, the Bible's telling us that they petitioned the Lord for his safe rescue. James tells us in chapter 5, verse 16, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we've seen as we have gone through Acts that prayer was was one of the building blocks of the early church. From the start of the church's history, we saw it in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, that they remained steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. We, we saw that there were elements of the early church, and we followed that practice all the way through the book of Acts. The early church is a praying church. From the start, devotion was given to prayer. And the people had seen, the people had seen God answer prayer. And, and fervent prayer was offered up constantly. God is a God who answers prayer. There's no doubt about it. But sometimes we, we don't understand that. We'll see that in a moment. I, I had just gotten saved, went in the military. I've shared this with you before, but this is one of the foundational things that the Lord was teaching me about prayer. And we were driving home on leave from Fort, Fort Ord, coming south to go to, uh, to my home in Norwalk. We had a, a, a we were taking, um, coming home in a 1955 or 56 Buick. And some of you are old enough to remember that. Um, some of you have seen pictures of those cars. They were huge, huge cars. We had, uh, I, I know it was at least six, it could have been seven of us, comfortably seated in this Buick. There was a ton of us. And we were coming home, and we're coming from home from Fort Ord, which is up there by Monterey. 
We made it down about 10 miles north of Santa Maria, just outside of San Luis Obispo, and the car breaks down. And we're pulled over on the side of the road. This was many years ago now, 40 some years ago. And the roads at that time were not like they are now where you have freeways going through. They were like two laners. And as we were there, 10 miles out of Santa Maria, there's not a lot of lights or anything out there. We're, there are all these guys on the side of the road and it's barren. And we're thinking, how are we going to get out of here? The car's broken down. And so we start to walk. And we're leaving two of the guys behind with the car. The rest of us are beginning to walk. And I actually walk up to the side of the road. There's no cars coming, but I, I'm standing there ready to try and hitchhike. That's what I'm going to do. And as I do that, my friend Bill says to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're Christians. God answers prayer. Now me, I'm three months old in Jesus. But, yeah, that's right. God answers prayer. Oh, great Apostle Bill. <laughs> and I, God is my witness. We, we bow our heads. And all of our friends who are with us, not one of them is a Christian. Bill and I are the only two who profess Christ, and Bill himself wasn't even saved at that time. That's another story. <laughs> but we prayed. Father, in Jesus' name, you know we want to go home. Would you please help us? There's nothing out here. You've got to picture it. It's like you're in the, you're in the middle of nowhere. There's no cars, and any car that goes by, you think they're going to pull over for all these guys? No. Father, would you please help us? We, need, we want to go home. As God is my witness, within two, three minutes, a Volkswagen appears on the horizon coming towards us and pulls over. It's a young girl who's got to be 17 and a young boy who is probably 13 or 14. She rolls over to the side of the road and the kid rolls his window down and she speaks to Bill and me, a friend of mine named Mike and one other guy, and she says, I don't know why I'm stopping, but I'm a Christian, and God just told me to pull over and give you a ride. <laughs> I go, yeah. <laughs> and so what we do is, this will help me to remember how many guys there were, because what we did is we put two of them in the back. And we said, she said, I will take them to the bus station in Santa Maria. And I'll come around and come back. And if you guys need help, I'll take you too. So now we're just rejoicing. God is great. God is great. We start walking towards Santa Maria. What are you going to do now, Lord? A Volkswagen van pulls over. Volkswagens are my friend, now that I think about it. <laughs> a Volkswagen van pulls over. And the driver says, where are you guys going? What happened? Well, the car broke down. Yeah, I saw it. It's right there. Yeah, car broke down. Where are you guys going? Well, we're in Santa Maria, 10 miles outside of Santa Maria. We're going to Norwalk, but we have a friend named Mike Feeney, and Mike is going to Huntington Beach. The guy says, I'm on my way to Huntington. And me and my friend, we'll, we'll drop you guys off in Norwalk and we'll take your buddy home to Huntington Beach. And so Bill and I climb in the back of this Volkswagen luxury van. You know, it's, <laughs> and Mike is in the front. Mike spends time talking to the driver. The guy in the back is a Christian. And we talk a little bit about the Lord. We fall asleep. Hour and a half, two hours, however long it took us to get to Norwalk. He pulls over, drops us off. We go home. Mike is driven all the way to, um, to Huntington. The other two guys were picked up by the young lady in the Volkswagen. They eventually got their car back. Who'd want to steal it? Uh, it doesn't <laughs> run. Um, and that's when the Lord began to try to teach me that he answers prayer. 
Do you want to hear a sad thing? Is you forget. You forget. How many prayers has God answered for you? And the next time you pray, you act as if you won't. Isn't that amazing? But it's true. It's true. And so what we see here is an interesting prayer meeting. We'll look at it in some detail as we get into this. But again, they're petitioning the Lord, saying, please release the apostle. There's agony involved, and it is the effective, fervent prayer. So as this is taking place, it says uh, in verse 7, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, a light shone in the prison, and, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. His chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment, follow me. So he went out and followed him. Didn't know that what was done by the angel was real. He, he, he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And so that's kind of interesting. Peter's sound asleep. Now that by itself ought to say something to us because the fact that he's there, he's in, in, in prison, if you will. He's, he's bound to two guards. He's being watched. There's 16 men keeping an eye on him, and yet he's fast asleep. In Isaiah, it says in chapter 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The word stayed there because his mind is anchored on you. And you will keep him in perfect peace. Uh, so the psalmist in Psalm 4 verse 8 said it like this, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And so you know that there's hardly anything as wonderful as the sleep of a righteous person because you know that God's in control. I was asked a question recently, when is, what is, what is uh, one of the lessons the Lord has taught you uh, in your walk with God um, at this point? And uh, my answer was very simple. Uh, I'm learning at this point, and I said I think kind of like this, don't sweat the small stuff. You know what, God's in control. One of the things when I was younger that I didn't know that I know now that I'm older is very, very simply this. You know, when I find myself in a situation that I have no control over, the wisest thing I can do is trust the Lord because he's in full control. And I've discovered over the years, and I encourage you who are young especially to learn this now, uh, God's in control. He will have his way. He's always good, and he always will blow your mind at his plans. He, he will. That's a fact. I, I'm not, I'm, yeah, that's worth, that's worth that huge applause. That's true. <laughs> Why would he be able to sleep? Well, let me give you one, one reason that's probably something that, well, because he could trust the Lord Jesus at his word. There's something that you see. It's one of my favorite portions of scripture. It's found in John chapter 21. Um, Jesus is speaking to the Apostle Peter in John 21. And he says to him in verse 18, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Hidden within that, is a promise that he's going to grow old when you're old. Peter is not old in this portion of Scripture. And so in the back of his mind, Jesus said, you're going to grow old. I'm not old. I may feel old, but I'm not old. So in the back of your mind, you could rest because, no, 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 I still have some things to do. 
so I might as well go to sleep when I can. We'll see what the Lord's going to do. By the way, in that, in that same passage, when Jesus said that to, to Peter, you know how the apostle responded to that? Some of you know the story. It's one of my favorite portions of scripture because I've learned a lot from it. He looks and he sees John, the one whom Jesus loved. You remember that? He looks and sees him. When Jesus says, you're going you're gonna to die, is what he's saying. But you're going to be old when you die. But he looks, the scripture says, and he sees John, the one whom Jesus loved, and he says, what about him? That's one of my favorite portions of scripture. It really is. Because I have a tendency of doing that. You know, okay, fine. But, but what about him? What, what about him? How come he gets away with so much? How come it seems, what about him? And I love Jesus' response. Mark this in your heart. Jesus says, what has he got to do with you? You follow me. Listen, if more Christians would understand that and leave other people's lives in the hands of the Lord when they don't necessarily have to be involved, there'd be a whole lot more peace in the body of Christ. Because sometimes we're, we are what we call sin sniffers. <laughs> now, of course, I, I better hasten to say, it's not as if I should ignore blatant sin because I love you. I don't want you to go through pain. Of course, I'm going to share with you. But it's difference in having to approach with tears somebody who's, who's, who's failing because your heart is broken for them. And it's a difference between that and judging people because they don't live up to your standards. And so we have to be aware of that. And so in this particular case, Jesus said to him, when you're old, and Peter's not old yet, and so he's able to sleep, and God will keep him in perfect peace. It's interesting how when he wrote, when Peter wrote 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he said this, he said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for, me, for you. So experience speaks. When it says in verse 7, an angel of the Lord stood by him, um, what happens is he touches him, basically awakens him. The chains fall off his hands, and he gets up, he dresses, and he leaves. The, the angel says, you need to get dressed, gird yourself. And so, as Peter is still half asleep, so far as he knows, he's simply dreaming or seeing a vision. He passes between the first, goes past the second guard post. It's possible they didn't see him, maybe that their eyes were blinded. And then he comes to the final gate. That was made of heavy iron. And, and this heavy iron gate swings open on its own. And as this happens, verse 11, Peter had come to himself. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. And so he says within himself, uh, you know, God is, is, is released me. You see, the expectation of the people was for him to be executed. And he wakes up and, to himself and says, this isn't a dream. I'm free, and I'd better get out of here. And so what does he do? Well, verse 12, when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced, Peter stood before the gate. They said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Shut up. We're praying for him to be released. <laughs> that, that's what's taking place. Shut up. We're praying for him to be released. Now leave us alone. Now we'll look at a couple things here. Um, one thing, it speaks of them, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname is Mark. And so we'll look at that for just a moment. This woman here, Mary, um, is a wealthy woman. She has servants. Uh, she has a large house capable of holding a great number of people. And that in itself was a bit unusual because uh, there are not many wealthy who were followers of Jesus even to this day. And the believers in Jerusalem at that time were poor. They were persecuted. They were in need of help. And we just saw how that uh, aid was sent to the church in Jerusalem for relief. 
And so Mary had wealth and she used her wealth to be a blessing to the body of Christ. We see also John, who's also known as Mark. So we call him John Mark. John Mark eventually will become well known to us. When you look at him, he, he is Peter's traveling companion. He's the cousin of Barnabas, and he wrote the gospel of Mark. It may be that he actually introduces us to himself in his own gospel, because when you look at Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52, it reads, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. And there are many Bible commentators who say that he's actually referring to himself. So as this is taking place, Peter's knocking at the door. This young woman, this girl named Rhoda, answers. She hears his voice and recognizes that it's him. She's glad. She doesn't open the gate. She runs and tells the people, Peter's here. And their response, you are beside yourself. So Rhoda's a servant of Mary. She hears the voice and is excited. And basically, she comes into the prayer meeting and she's saying, your prayers are answered. Peter's outside the door. You know, the scripture God says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me, I'll answer thee and I'll blow your mind with my answers. They apparently forgot. And this is going to be an important point that I'm going to make here. I've already alluded to it. They apparently forgot that God can do the impossible. God answers prayer. God can do the impossible. Yesterday, Tuesday night, in the, in the banquet hall, at 6 o'clock, we had a wedding. And I performed it. And the woman who got married 60 years old. I wonder if she's planning on having kids. <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we, had, we have a brother in the fellowship. He was 80 years old when he got married. 80. And his wife's in her 70s. And we have a general a standard, um, you know, you fill in certain things for premarital counseling. And so one of the questions, the standard question is, do you plan on having children? <laughs> He's 80 and she's in her 70s. And I love his answer. He writes, if it happens, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> his name's Abram. <laughs> 60 years old. Never been married. Never been married. Her husband is one day older than she is. He was born August 3rd. She was born August 4th. He lived two and a half miles from where she lived. He lived actually by my, my grandmother. My grandmother's house is on Pioneer Boulevard in Norwalk, and he lived in that neighborhood. We grew up in Norwalk on Orange Road. We used to walk to my grandmother's house. It was a mile and a half from where I lived. He, he lived as a little boy uh, real close, but they never met because at an early age, he and his family moved out. Long story made short. They went two different directions for a long time. Now here's my sister walking up the aisle, and there's this man, her husband's name is Frank, standing next to me. And I'm looking at Frank, and I'm looking at my sister, and I know their testimonies. And my sister was seduced into lesbianism at the age of 18. And it occurred in a church with a music minister who groomed her from the time she was a young teen and waited till she was 18 so that she couldn't get in trouble for doing it. My sister Becky went into lesbianism for 24 solid years. You know the story. I don't want to tell you her husband's story, 
but it's a movie could be made easily about this man. I'll say one thing, he spent 16 years in prison. Shot three times, stabbed twice. And he got saved. And he was dropping cards off at houses in the neighborhood my sister lived in, lives in, and she began to talk to him. And as they're talking, he asks her, what, what are you all about? And she says, I'm all about Jesus. She says, I love Jesus and I serve him with all my heart. And he looks at her and he says, oh, that's great. Where do you go to church? I'm looking for a church. So she says, I go to Calvary Chapel in uh, Los Lunas. And he goes there that night to go to church. She sees him, they say hi. He goes there on Sunday, she sees him, they say hi again. Before you know it, they're having coffee. Before you know it, he says to her, look into these eyes. And she looks into his eyes and he says, do you know what you see? And she says, what? The face of your future husband. A romantic jerk. <laughs> so I performed their wedding yesterday. Yes. And a lady, one of my sister's dearest friends, dearest friends, walks up to me and says this. Did you ever think this was going to happen? And I immediately I answered. I said, no. And I said, no, wait a minute. I guess I can say yes, but I didn't know how this would be answered because... I have been, and my wife and I have been praying for Becky for a long time, that God would just provide for her. Just do what you, what you want to do. And I have said this to the Lord. I say this openly to you. It's, it's, it's kind of a private thing, but I'll share with you. I'd say my, my baby sister's lonely, Jesus. She's lonely. Would you do something for her? Would you? And he did. And the thing is, my God is able. My, my God is able. I have seen, I have seen what he does, but I never presume on him either. I'm not telling him his business. He runs the universe. I'm his servant. I'm his son. So, Lord, you, and this is my prayer, I'm just telling you. She's your baby. She's lonely. Do something for her, would you? Would you? And he did. And I have to be honest with you. When she told me, David, I got something to tell you. And I said, and what would that be? She says, I went on a date. <laughs> I thought, can such a thing be so? The Lord, I, I, my heart, I think, is like these people in the prayer meeting, praying and praying and praying, and when the prayer is answered, you're out of your mind. Because <laughs> that, that's what they're saying. By the way, that's a little translation. You are beside yourself is another way of saying you're out of your mind. This is not so. It's, again, asking and asking and asking, and I'm certain they're saying, Lord, protect him. Lord, bring him out safely. And she's saying, hey, he did. He's at the door. And uh, would you shut up? We're, we're busy praying, and we don't want you to interrupt us. So they say, you're mad. 
You're, you're not in your right mind. And yet she kept insisting, verse 15, that it was so. And so what is their response? Well, they get spiritual. Well, it's his, it's, it's his angel. And so she actually has to argue with them. And so they think, well, you know, God has assigned a, a guardian angel, and that's what it is. Um, but as all of this has taken place, verse 16, Peter continued knocking. And they opened the door and saw him. They were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand, keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. And as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. And so he's trying to keep things quiet. He doesn't want to alert the neighbors. So when the people begin to make noise, he says, you need to be quiet. And he explains what happened. He tells them, report it to James and the other brethren. Now, obviously, this James is the Lord's brother who has become the overseer of the church in the city of Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 17, after this, he, speaking of Peter, departed and he went to another place uh, because he wanted to keep them safe because he is now going to be a hunted man. Now, there's no small uh, stir among the soldiers. And what happens is, is Herod is, uh, is paranoid and he feels a conspiracy exists. And so what does he do? He executes the guards. And it shows you just how bloodthirsty that man is. He went down, according to verse 19, from Judea to Caesarea, stayed there. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord and Having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. He was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. <laughs> Isn't that interesting how that's phrased? He's dead, but <laughs> good news. Uh, <laughs> Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So we'll close with a few comments here. Now, when he stood up and he gave his oration, his speech, and the people began to shout the voice of a God and not a man, this was taking place in a place called Caesarea which is to the north of Jerusalem, the north and the west. We go there every time we go to Israel. There is an amphitheater there. And um, there's a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. And Josephus records that Herod was wearing a robe made of silver thread. And when he entered the amphitheater early in the morning, the sun shone on it and it was brilliant. The people cried out that he was not a man but a god. Josephus states that Herod did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. And so in verse 23, it says, an angel of the Lord struck him. Why? He did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms. One commentator said this could have been what is called the dog tape worm. Sheep and cattle serve as hosts for this parasite. The dog eats infected meat and man gets the eggs from the dog. The disease includes the formation of cysts, generally on the liver, that may extend into the abdominal cavity. The rupture of a cyst may release as many as two million developing worms called scolices, which can cause sudden death. So Josephus records that he lingered for five days and died a painful death. Remember that when Peter had come to the home of Cornelius and Cornelius had shown him such, such honor and Peter rejected it, well, Herod received it. And as a result of that, he was judged and he died. Now, in spite of the opposition of man, 
the word of God continues to grow and multiplies. Keep that in mind, and I'll close with two thoughts. Just because people, we'll put it this way, just because you may read something or hear something is said on TV doesn't mean that everybody agrees with that commentator. Just because something is written in a newspaper doesn't mean that they are factually giving to you insight into the condition of all people's hearts. That's just not true. But what it does is it discourages you from actually opening up because you're saying things like, well, nobody's really interested in Jesus anymore. They're not interested in the Bible. That is absolutely not true. That is not true. People are interested in the Bible. They may not have the same preconceived notions I had as a kid. If you said Bible, I'd say inspired by God. They may not still have those understanding or that kind of belief. They might say, well, I'm not quite sure about it. But when you teach them and you show them and you, and you explain it, you will be surprised at how many people are very interested. You will be surprised. And a lot of times what happens is the world is brainwashing the church into silence. Oh, they don't care. They're not interested. Listen, two things. Pray. Pray for God to speak. Pray for God to speak to your friends. Pray for God to speak to your family. Pray for God to speak to your neighborhood. Pray for God to speak on your work site. Pray that God will use you somehow to reach people for Jesus. Get devoted to prayer and to trust the Lord to do what God has promised. Because in spite of the opposition, God has a way of dealing with those who oppose. Because remember, Herod was killing the leadership of the church and God just disposes of him. God has a way of removing opposition to open doors for the word to go forth. Don't forget that. See, I didn't, I, 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 when I got saved to this day, I, I, didn't, I didn't think that people weren't interested. I, I knew they must be. The Bible's God's word. God has a plan. God can do things. I knew that. So I innocently, maybe even naively, along with a multitude of others, began to just share those things. And the churches, some of the churches that you know that are Calvary Chapel are pastored by guys just like that, just like that. We got saved, we believed God's word, and God did some marvelous things. And you know what? I believe until Jesus comes that God will continue to do marvelous things. He continues to save people. He continues to set them free. He continues to transform. He does that because God is, that, is able, and I trust him to do that. And so even though there's opposition, it doesn't mean that you can keep God from moving. Your arms are too short to box with God. Remember that? <laughs> it's true. And then finally, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So John Mark accompanies Barnabas and Saul. He's helping them in ministry, and we're going to be seeing him again in in a short while, and you're going to see one of the, one of the, one of the things about him that um, Paul has a problem with him. We'll just put it that way. And I want to show you a couple things when we get there about the problem that Paul had and the attitude that Barnabas had. But right now, we're introduced to John Mark as a traveling companion. We'll leave it there, but we'll see him again shortly. <laughs> 